Even if we want to liberalize the capital account, it does not necessarily mean we have to liberalize 100%. Maybe 80%, maybe 70% is, is appropriate for, um, for us. Studying more closely when, how, and what policies were considered and why China's economic policy makers made the choices that they did helps us appreciate that China's policy making was always a fragile process that could have gone in different directions. To capture an idea of the origins of the ideological framework that China's economic policy makers are guided by, and perhaps more importantly, to help me project some of the likely policies that will guide China into the future, I had the privilege of visiting the Gocha Fatsang Yan Chiu Yuan or the National School of Development at Beijing University. The National School of Development campus is situated deep inside the beautiful campuses of Beida, which is short for Beijing University. The campus is just behind the Summer Palace and very beautiful at the onset of autumn. I met and spoke with Huang Yiping, the Sinar Mas Chair Professor of Finance and Economics at the school, whose work I've been able to follow in recent years. He is also the Director of the Institute of Digital Finance at Beita, although I did not get a chance to talk to him about that as a topic. Professor Huang's career traces back to that famous meeting in Mogan Shan in 1984 when he was a student at the time. China's policymakers are a close-knit community of economists who have influenced each other's thinking perhaps over a hundred-year period. It is possible to track the influences of economists from the days of Sun Yefang in the pre-communist era to Wu Jinglian, who argued for a market-based Marxist economy, or Zhu Jiaming, who organized the now famous original Morganchan Conference in 1984. These were the mentors of subsequent policymakers, including the highly respected Zhou Xiaochuan, who was the governor of the People's Bank of China until very recently, and who still wields considerable influence, or Chang Weiying, who was the author of China's now famous dual track pricing mechanism that guided the country to transition into a liberal economy, but avoided the mistakes of the Soviet Union and other countries that chose the Big Bang approach promoted in the West by the so-called Washington Consensus. The National School of Development was set up in 1994 by Justin Yifu Lin as the Chongguo Qingqi Yanqiu Chongxin or the China Center of Economic Research. Justin Lin, famous for his work on structural economics in developing countries, was one of China's earliest graduates from the famous University of Chicago economics faculty. I had a lot of questions for Professor Huang Yiping, for which he provided insights candidly and very generously. I have great respect for Professor Huang's clear and direct insights into the Chinese economy. I focused our conversation on three important areas. Firstly, the history of economic decision-making in China. Secondly, the framework of current policies especially the relationship between the state and private sectors. Thirdly, the future trajectory of policymaking. In particular, I wanted to test the prospects for the liberalization of the renminbi and the opening up of China's capital markets.
professor of economics and finance at uh, um, this uh, school, um, National School of Development at the Peking University, and my own interest is mainly on financial sector development. So financial reform, macro uh, monetary policy, um, and uh, uh, what we've been working on also FinTech recently. I'm actually very um, excited to be here in this campus. Um, it's very beautiful. It's uh, part of uh, the, uh, for the, for the uh, previous um, uh, summer palace. Um, and uh, it's got an incredible history uh, in terms of uh, being the home of economic policy making uh, in modern day China. Mm. So I want to capture a little bit of that in our conversation. Sure. Um, so the, my, my, my first question really will be, uh, give me a sense of how economic thought evolved uh, in China uh, after Deng Xiaoping um, you know, started the process of liberalizing the economy. Mm. Uh, because uh, we are very familiar with the story of Shenzhen and um, you know, the decisions made to open up certain parts of the country and so on. But there was this whole economic mechanism that needed to evolve uh, from a controlled command economy to a liberal economy. Mm. And in the early days, um, the focus really was, or rather the global trend and the global sentiment was the Big Bang approach. And China didn't take the Big Bang approach. Right. China took a gradual approach. And it was in campuses like this where professors like yourself uh, who today have become leading decision makers, um, you know, have started formulating uh, the process of liberalizing price control. So give me a sense of how that evolved. Well, I think it's a good question to ask why China uh, pursued a different approach, what do we call gradualism, um, compared to the short therapy. Um, people in, uh, um, in this group um, start to play active roles in early days, like in the very beginning of the 1980s, especially starting with the rural reform um, and then moved on to reform um, items in um, the urban area. But I would probably say the beginning of the reform or adoption of this gradualistic approach is probably not designed by somebody like intended thought, economic thought, to prepare for this. I think if you look at what happened at the end of 1978 when reform started, bottom line was we had 30 years of central planning. And that worked in some areas, but didn't work in terms of lifting a living standard of people. Uh, so consumer goods were, were in severe shortage. Um, that was, uh, I think, one of the reasons why um, Deng Xiaoping um, decided to move ahead with some kind of liberalization. The question about whether or not we should adopt a shock therapy or a gradualistic approach, and nowadays people are all discussing why the former Soviet Union adopted a different approach, and we did it this way. I think in part this was just determined by the political atmosphere because we decided to reform, but the agenda at the time was not to move to a free market economy. The short-term objective was really to improve efficiency and to produce more goods for the consumers. And I would say gradualistic approach was mainly determined by the political constraint. You can imagine in 1978, when some leaders say, we want reform, nobody would be able to voice the term market economy. What you can say is, well, we should do things better on the margin. So in the end, you find that this is more about pragmatism. And you can do things gradually better. But that, in part, was constrained by um, the political uh, condition. Meaning, at the time, I don't know what Deng Xiaoping had in mind, but even if he had in mind that the ultimate goal is to establish a free market economy, he wouldn't be able to sell to his colleagues at the time. 
So it's more about a piecemeal um, improvement. So the question here mm. really is, um, you know, did there evolve uh, two school of thoughts? Uh, mm. You know, and I get the sense there's this the gradualist school of thought, which is what you mentioned in your um, in, in his <laughs> remarks, um, uh, and and it went into the dual track uh, reform and so on, and and then there was the package reformers, um, you know, centered a lot around the Chinese Academy of Social right. Sciences. Mm. So is that what it is right now? Would you you know would you call it as two schools of thought, or and how did it evolve? I, I think the distinguishing today is much less visible. Uh, but in the 1980s, it was quite clear. Uh, the question is if you should move ahead the piecemeal approach step by step, or you should actually address the problem in one shot. Um, I think the gradual approach, as I said, was more determined by the political constraint at the beginning. Since we have to maintain a portion of the central planning, we have to maintain the SOEs, then the question is, how do you ensure a gradual and a smooth transition? The dual track liberalization approach, and what we nowadays we often say is new policy for new people and old policy for older people. Um, and initially was proposed by one of my colleagues here, uh, Professor Zhang Weiying, who uh, attended the Morgan San mm -hmm. conference in 1984. At the time, he was still a graduate student. Right. You can't believe um, he wrote this article about uh, um, the idea of dual track price reform. For the state, for the older part of the central planning, you maintain the, st the old state price. But then you liberalize the other track, let the prices to be liberalized. So, give you an example for the grains, um, which was the main component I worked on um, in the 1980s when after I graduated from a university um, close to here. Ramin University. Ramin right? University. Yeah. Uh, my first job was to conduct an experiment of how to liberalize the grain prices. So what happened was the government will continue to purchase the grain from farmers at state price and a supply to the urban residents because urban people, um, their income was stable and they couldn't afford like a sudden jump in a, a market price. So that just makes sure that the transition is smooth. The older supply and the price continues. It's really about stability. But at the same time, you allow farmers to produce more. And if you can produce more, you can sell in market then the prices will be higher, so the incentive will be there for them to produce uh, more. That was the original idea of Zhang Weiying's uh, uh, proposal of a due uh, track price reform. But that idea was generally applied. For instance, when we want to um, uh, liberalize the eco urban economy, we really wanted the foreign investor firms and the private enterprises to grow rapidly. But at the same time, you want to make sure the SOEs don't collapse overnight right. because that would cause other problems. So again, you have this uh, dual track approach. The reason why I said that the distinguishing between, between these two schools are less visible today is because even for these people proposing the dual track liberalization approach, what in their mind, I believe, is eventually the, st the state track will go away. So you're not going to like maintain it forever. Now, whether it's going away smoothly as they expected, that's another question. Mm. So that was more for a transition purpose. It's not like a long-term uh, strategy. Mm. Eventually, hopefully, for instance, in the case of private sector and SOEs, because the private sector would grow very rapidly, and then eventually you would know the proportion, the portion of the SOEs in the whole overall economy will be very, very small. And you, in a market economy. Talk to me a little bit about property ownership, especially in the urban mm. areas. Mm. Uh, that seems to be uh, an area where you wanted, well, China wanted to. Um, you know, be attractive to foreign investors, so there will be hot money, uh, mm. you know, FDI and so on. But you mm. avoided the path taken taken by mm. Russia um, mm. uh, and several other countries, uh, you know, in liberalizing too quickly. 
um, property ownership. So mm. uh, where did that feature in, in the whole evolution? Well, property ownership uh, um, is not a big part of our liberalization. If you look at, for instance, cross-border capital uh, flows, uh, we start to liberalize that capital account. But really, I think uh, the government followed a strategy, what I summarize as long-term first, short-term uh, second. Um, equity first um, and a portfolio um, second. So, 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 so you are seeing a lot of, uh, and the inflow first and outflow second. So what do we found that during the past uh, um, couple of decades, uh, a lot of F in, FDI inflows, that would be good regard the view that by the uh, policymakers because they come to China to build factory, to create jobs and uh, produce GDP. That's very good. But the officials have been very reluctant to number one on the outflows, uh, which was some kind of different now. We have a lot of outflow FDI. But in terms of portfolio investment in um, the capital market, that's much, much uh, more restricted. Property ownership is not really something not open up. Where, where is this debate on liberalizing the current account uh, right now? Where, the where capital is, account. The capital account, yeah. The current account was opened in 1996. And the original idea was, well, maybe China would take another five to 10 years to liberalize the capital account. Um, in fact, the then um, governor of PBOC, um, Dai Xianlong, Wrote, an, wrote a letter right. to IMF to inform IMF that we have done this and we're going to get on with the second uh, letter. When he writes a letter like that, mm. uh, on what confidence does he write that? Because getting a buy-in even internally is, is a process. I think there was probably some cons consensus, consensus among that policymakers okay. that it takes five to ten years to liberalize the capital account. But I think you, I mean, as I said at the very beginning, the real, the right term to characterize the Chinese reform approach is not really like gradualism or a dual track. I think it's a pragmatism. Okay. What you really, I mean, w w the best way to, 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 to characterize it is what cat theory of Deng Xiaoping. White cat, cat or black, black cat, cat doesn't uh, matter. Yeah. as long as you catch cat a mice, cat. it's a good cat. Okay. So this was really the whole philosophy about economic reform policy. While PBOC said that we're going, move, going to move on to liberalize the capital account, what happened was the following year, in 1997, there was a big Asian financial crisis. So that job was delayed. Um, and after the Asian financial crisis, following China's accession to WTO, then we restarted to liberalize the capital account, especially when China's foreign exchange reserves accumulated yeah. rapidly right. around 2003, 2004, and everybody is like pressuring China to um, appreciate the currency, to open up the capital account. So they moved ahead um, uh, further, but then we got to 2008 and so on. So one way of summarizing um, what I observed during the last uh, couple of decades, you always say, well, we want to liberalize the capital account. And then when something happened, and you suddenly said, gosh, fortunately, we haven't opened it yet. Yes. Because if we open the capital account, we'll see much, much more devastating consequences. So this presents a serious question. I think China wants to open up the capital account. There's no question. Most people feel that eventually want to open. Well, the, the, uh, you know, the considerations for and against, and right, right. now, the right. against seems to be longer a little bit, right? But uh, uh, Not necessarily. I think for China, given the stage of development, China probably want to move ahead okay. to liberalize more. Okay. But the question is... Uh, I think one lesson we need to take very seriously is that many developing countries experience the financial crisis after they open up. So the question That's is, the number one, yeah. well, the price to pay, but also I think we need to look at seriously at number one, what the preconditions we need to prepare before we take this move, right? 
So for instance, interest rate liberalization, exchange rate liberalization, if you don't have these, forget about liberalizing the capital account. Second, even when you're liberalizing, there might be a proper sequencing of liberalization. Some things should do first than others. Mm. And in the past, I once um, summarized a way of thinking about this. You should liberalize the real economy first and then the financial sector. Real economy means the fiscal system, the trade liberalization, and so on. Then you start to think about the financial uh, reform. You think about the financial services sector liberalization first, and then the capital account, like introducing foreign banks to China, that's much less risky. But opening up the cross-border capital flows are probably riskier. And you want to liberalize the exchange rate first before you move on. So I think sequencing is also very important. Finally, I think we also needed to put into place some macroprudential measures, meaning, well, if, if you're going to allow the, the, the capital to flow, to flow across the border freely, uh, there will be some consequences. Positive benefit, we like, but what about these negative consequences? So therefore, you need things like uh, um, Tobin tax or some reserve requirement, just make sure to slow down some of the very volatile capital account. Eventually, I think there is a, a more fundamental question now, this is, this is becoming more um, general now. Um, even if we want to liberalize the capital account, it does not necessarily mean we have to liberalize 100%. Maybe 80%, maybe 70% is, is appropriate for, um, for us. Interesting. Uh, what is 80% liberalization? I mean, it's like 80% pregnant, uh, you know. Um, is there... Um, an inflection point. The IMF had this a broader category, seven broader category, and 40 um, individual categories of capital flows. Um, when I said 80% or 70% or 90%, I'm more thinking there are areas where you don't feel 100% confident, but they could become volatile, and these are the ones you should retain your restrictions. And I'll give you one example. Um, I think these derivative products, cross-border investment by individuals, I think these should be restricted because, number one, the risks are much more difficult to recognize and understand. So if you just open up and let everybody to buy, you're inviting a lot of risks. But you can allow the institutions to invest in these products because they will be very good um, uh, for managing risks. Uh, from a banking point of view, China is actually very banking-centric. Uh, True. It's not market-centric in, in, in that regard. And um, you know, every day that you don't liberalize the capital account, mm. uh, the cost of funds domestically is very high. The banking system being a state-owned enterprise infrastructure, uh, is being subsidized. If you, I mean, if, if that's one way to look at it, mm. uh, you know, because of the high interest rates. Uh, do you think that there has to be a dismantling of of the banking dependence of the economy? Well, this is again a very tricky question. Um, as an economist, we look at the uh, financial structure, and one thing economists always uh, um, comes to is that uh, financial market, the capital market is much more capable of supporting innovation because we are now into a new stage of development. The information becomes the new driver of Chinese growth. If you can't support innovation, um, there's no future for the economy. Um, but in, compared to the, the, to the banking sector, capital market does much better in uh, supporting innovation. Um, so, so everybody is arguing, and even the policy now is saying we need to develop a multi-layer capital market and increase the proportion of um, direct finance in total financial indemnification. Uh, I fully support. But the, to the question of you, can we reduce the dependency on the banks, um, I'm very doubtful. I think there are reasons why China is bank uh, dominant. Mm. If you look at the developed economies, I mean, we also see like a market dominated financial system in the US and a bank dominated financial system in Germany. 
both of them like uh, politically democratic right. and a free market system, why they have different financial systems? My own view is the differences are not determined by policy. They're determined by your culture, politics, legal system, a lot of things. So in other words, even if Germany wants to develop the capital market, I mean, obviously they can raise the proportion uh, from here. But I suspect, I doubt, um, they would be able to develop a financial system like the US. If that's the case, if you agree with me, then my implication is, well, China can, can, can develop the capital market. But I think China would probably be more like Germany than like the US in the perceivable future. So my conclusion is, yes, capital market definitely will become more important. But in the perceivable future, at least before I retire, and I will retire probably relatively soon, um, the banking sector will still dominate the yeah, Chinese financial I, system. Mm, I'm not saying that the banking system per se is good or bad. It's, uh, in Germany, I think the, uh, it's also the per capita profile. Uh, mm. the, the individual is not leveraged as in the US. Yeah. Uh, it's a source of incredible cheap yeah. liabilities. Yeah. Uh, so the banking system absorbs the liabilities of the system. Yeah. Uh, China, the savings rate is also very high, and True. so it'll be captured in, in the banking system probably. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, but uh, when you see all the amazing things that have, that have happened in China recently, um, the capital market uh, is essentially driven by the private sector. Mm. Uh, Go Suqing made this comment that the private sector now accounts for more than 50% of the taxation in the country. Yeah. Uh, you know, and, and a lot of that uh, is, is actually foreign capital, mm. right? Uh, mm. they, they raise capital abroad. Mm. So then the question is, um, you know, when will China have a, a robust capital market that is not state-centric? Um, um, that's really free market. Well, yeah. that, that, that relates to the point I was referring to. Um, the, 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 the way um, or your capability of building an effective capital market um, is de dependent on many factors, your legal system, your political system, your culture, um, and so on. My sense is, so for instance, financial regulation. You can't rely on a financial regulation that is heavily influenced by policies. For instance, sometimes we have regulators adjusting their policies following the volatilities of the macroeconomy. That's not something the regulators should do, right? The regulators should maintain order of the financial market and maintain fair competition. But, but, but our regulators looking into very different things only last two years, I think the capital market regulators start to do the right things. I mean, they have this uh, three-term uh, 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 propaganda saying establishing institutions, zero tolerance, and no intervention into the market operation. If these three objectives or principles are seriously implemented, I think we can go a long way. Um, in uh, developing the capital market. But, but overall, I think it will be quite a challenging. Just to add one more element to that, to that flow, uh, mm. the liberalization of the renminbi, right? Sure. Uh, how much of that is rhetoric? Because I hear it everywhere, but when you really think about it, uh, all of the Chinese exporters uh, or any Chinese corporation doing business mm. on the Belt and Road uh, is asking for dollar, you mm. know, and dollar is cheaper. Um, <clears throat> so the the reality of it is that you know the dollar is still the you know the operating currency for right. many reasons. Mm. Um, at the same time, as long as you don't liberalize the capital account, uh, this whole idea of um, renminbi internationalization, liberalization, right. Right. Uh, is just a rhetoric. <clears throat> Give me a sense of how that journey will evolve. Well, um, the first thing to note, um, as you um, noticed at the very beginning, the Chinese reform is never a shock therapy, a bigger bang. It's always gradually moving ahead. And I'll share with you my own experience. I've been watching the Chinese reform policy for more than 30 years and yes. probably 40 years now. 
And my own experience is every point of time in history, when I look at the Chinese reform policy, I always say, well, the policies should have been more aggressive. And I, then I realize this is just, maybe this is just a, a part of the gradualism because gra economists would think you should move to the optimal point. But the policy movement is always very gradual. And sometimes the move, you move three steps forward and two steps back, partly because of this gradualistic approach, but partly because sometimes political constraint. What is important, I think, I mean, I, I remain cautiously confident about the Chinese reform is after five years, 10 years, you look back, in most cases, you already see the policy moving ahead a big step. Okay. So that's, I think, a part of the gradualist approach. I think it's very useful to keep in mind. Economists are always unsatisfied by the policies okay. implemented. Yeah. That's an intellectual but, thing, yeah. But as long as you're moving ahead, right. now there is an old Chinese saying, uh, we are not afraid of moving slowly. We are afraid of stopping, standing still. Um, that's probably a useful thing to keep in mind. But that does not necessarily have nothing to improve in the approach and the, um, the, the internationalization of the currency you mentioned. We probably started from 2003, 2004, when people like in Hong Kong can hold their RMB deposit and so on. But the, 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 the real program of internationalization started in 2009. Right. And then there was a big setback in 2015 when we introduced this, uh, um, the reform of the central parity of the exchange rate. There was a 1.8% uh, um, depreciation on the day, and that encouraged, triggered a wide uh, wave of, of expectation of currency depreciation and the capital outflow and so on. So, um, so now we always divide the, um, the internationalization of RNB into two stages. The first stage is from 2009 to 2015, and the second stage is um, after that. Um, you actually find the difference between these two. Um, as you mentioned, uh, um, the, if you just rely on policy push, it's not sustainable. And I think that's one lesson we learned from the first stage of the internationalization policy. The government pushed for um, RMB settlement of cross-border trade, investment, and so it's on. It's just the infrastructure. For, for yeah. Hong Kong people to hold RMB and so on. But really, there was a very limited uh, asset um, denominated in RMB for them to hold then internationalization is not sustainable. Okay. People want to earn be only when the currency is appreciating. Yeah. When it starts to depreciate, then they just only all want to get rid of. So the second phase, I think, is moving into a different stage. From 2016, we are seeing two-way opening of the financial market, mm. right? So um, a number of the Chinese debt and the capital markets into the global yep. indices. Yep. Um, RNB is a part of the SDR basket and so on. So this, in my view, would be the key emphasis of the second stage. If the first stage of internationalization focused on settlement, payment, the second stage, I think now the new focus, is more on the investment vehicle. So whatever you do, you can, a non-resident can hold RNB assets. That's a longer term solution to the internationalization. But I mean, I, the, the, the point you made, and some people still want US dollar more than RNB, this would be a gradual process. I mean, I, I mean- Well, I mean, part of the reason for that actually is because uh, dollar is cheaper, and second is that they, they are incentivized to bring dollars in back into China mm. and not renminbi. You know, you, you, you pay a lower tax if you, if you brought dollar back. So there, 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 are number of, there are a number of these temporal reasons, but the broader picture is U.S. dollar is still the most important global currency. So in relative terms, of course, people want U.S. dollar more. And we are not trying to replace the dollar with RMB. We're only trying to expand the international rule of RMB a bit. Mm. And that can only be done 
very gradual. Mm. So you said two stages. Mm. Uh, I see the two stages. The third stage, I'd say there's a third stage where, where foreigners uh, are incentivized to hold renminbi because mm. assets are in renminbi. That's a part of the second stage, um, opening up the financial market to put our debt and equity into the international uh, financial market indices and so on. That was a part to encourage okay. foreign investors to hold more. Yeah, but that's financial assets, you know, uh, real assets like property in China and, and you know, uh, where the foreign corporation and individual is, uh, you know, actively involved in the Chinese economy. Well, they can hold a lot of equities for a very long time. I think the tricky thing is opening up the financial assets, so the equities, debts, and mm. so on. Mm. Whether or not we want to completely open the property sector, um, I think there is a big question. There are agendas that are, you know, fast, uh, overwhelming the system. Um, provincial level debt is one of them, mm. uh, and the amount of debt that the you know the national government had. Uh, had absorbed in order to build the infrastructure that you have right now, the amazing infrastructure, um, you know, puts China, you know, on uh, on the side of economies which are highly leveraged. Uh, mm. You know, how do you think these new agendas are shaping policy making or economic thinking in China right now? What, what new agenda? New agendas of uh, of uh, increased debt uh, of the economy. Uh, um, of, uh, well, the, sovereign the, debt. the policy actually want to deleverage um, and the overall um, non-financial um, debt is already 280% of GDP. Um, that's probably quite high, especially compared to developing countries. You have higher yeah, numbers, yeah, higher numbers you know, debt, yeah. for, for developing countries is very high. So I think uh, um, on the one hand, we, you probably want to raise more um, central government liabilities, but at the same time to reduce the liabilities of the local governments, and uh, especially these local investment vehicles, because these are non-government, but they are semi-government, because when they issue the debt and the investors are looking at they have an affiliation with the government, eventually it becomes a part of the responsibilities of the government. So I think uh, deleveraging would be an interesting thing. It's more about the structure, not reducing the debt. And as we discussed uh, um, already uh, uh, quite a number of times, uh, the Chinese financial system is bank-dominated, which basically means that that GDP ratio would be higher Anyway, by definition, yeah. because every yuan coming through the bank is ended up as a debt. So I think we have to accept that this liability, this leverage ratio would be high for China. And also plus one very important difference, if you look at China compared to many other countries, when we see local government and the central government, their liability is probably quite high. But most of these spending are not like just completely lost. Most of them invested in kind of infrastructure, yeah. some physical uh, property, yeah. and so on. So that phase of it, uh, the building of the infrastructure, which then you know also assists in uh, taking the income levels up, uh, yeah. you know, and uh, and the productivity levels up. So that contributed. That phase is well done, right? True. Uh, it's just that. Uh, is China now entering another phase where post-infrastructure um, leverage um, and in the upside on productivity and um, you know and and wage gain um, per mm. capita GDP? Right. Uh, there was one professor that we 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 both are familiar with who said that you know China is moving away from the middle income. It's going up to the you know to the True. high income yeah. um, uh, you know uh, category. Is that something that you subscribe to, and, and how do you think that works? Well, if you look at the, um, the World Bank uh, um, uh, uh, criteria, um, high-income economy um, has a GDP per capita of 12,600, and our number is already something like 11,000. So it's very close, um, I think, within the next two years.
unless something drastic right. happened. Otherwise, I think it would be classified as a high-income economy. But uh, uh, we should also recognize that I mean, high-income economy, the entry uh, level is still quite low compared to other developed countries in the US, um, Europe. You probably have 40, 50,000. And so we're still quite far away from these uh, um, countries. We still need to develop our technology um, um, and so on. That we need to take some hard decisions on some issues. And uh, sometimes we need a more um, top level design of the reform policies. Most of the policies in the past would kind of bottom up. But uh, uh, maybe it's time to look at uh, the reform issues and the policies from a more uh, systemic approach and uh, crack some hard nuts. That's something we needed to do. But I'm not sure if that's going to happen in all areas. And at the same time, you also put in some markets like 2008, you know, the US banking crisis, mm. 2015. Uh, there are external mm. factors that, uh, yeah. that, uh, you know, that sort of derails the process somewhat. Well, uh, definitely, definitely. Um, I, I think we're probably facing the same challenge now. 2015, um, when we reformed the central parity of the exchange rate, there was one step of depreciation, and that triggered a, a very broad expectation of uh, depreciation. Uh, but the background, in the, what in the background was uh, um, the likelihood of the Fed tapering um, or, ease, or, 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 or reversal, normalization of its monetary policy. I think we are at the same point, point again, again mm -hmm. right? And, mm -hmm. and given the uh, the amount of quantitative easing that has been yeah. pushed into the market yeah. uh, this last two years, yeah. it's amazing. Uh, that tapering alone is going to be Definitely. Uh, shaping the public policy of many countries. I, I think many countries will suffer, um, especially those very vulnerable ones. Um, China probably will be okay but uh, um, we may also see kind of the pressure for currency depreciation, capital outflow, and so on. Like what I mean, U.S. the Fed is still the most important central bank globally. So when the Fed is easing, everybody receives more liquidity. But when the Fed decides to tighten, money flows back to the U.S. Um, and so, what uh, what consequences do we have to bear? depend on the health of your own economy. At the same time, the U.S. economy is becoming increasingly financialized. Mm. Uh, it, it's no longer a real economy in the sense that uh, its own debt situation is 27, 29 trillion True. against the GDP of 19, 20, 20 trillion. So True. Uh, the ability to repay debt is now a moot point in the US. Mm. Um, you know, at the same time, it's got a capital market uh, that is bigger than anything in the world. Um, right. You know, and so that um, on the on the one hand, it's a global capital market that provides the structure for all of the other markets. Right. Uh, at the on the other hand, it's a financialization of an economy. True. Um, that makes it difficult to uh, relate to. Like China exports a lot to the U.S. So yeah. You know what would your exports look like? Um, you know, to relative to a highly finan financialized customer mm. in, in mm. that regard. Well, I guess it will be very volatile. Um, but, uh, but for the U.S., I, mean, I think, as you know, um, its a former president really wants to bring back a lot of manufacturing. As economists, we couldn't see any reason why it would happen. When your labor cost is yeah, at it's... that level, you want to compete with China or Vietnam on the manufacturing front, that's kind of uh, uh, unimaginable. But I think the U.S. has a very strong advantage as a leading economy. Its innovation sector is a world class. It's just probably unchallenged leader. And its financial system is also very well developed. So I think they probably should focus more on these instead of thinking, bringing back jobs in the automobile industry or some processing industry. That just doesn't make sense.
I think we've covered all the various different grounds and the elements uh, that goes into political thought and economic thought in China. Mm. So thank you Good. very much for thank spending you. time with me. Yeah, Thanks cheers. for coming. I left the conversation with a sense that the personalities influencing the direction of the Chinese economy are committed to eventual liberalization, but only when conditions allow. Also, there are new political conditions set on the economy to make it sustainable for the long term. Meeting Professor Huang and hearing from him firsthand gave me the sense that economic policy making in China is a very deliberate process that informs the political decisions the country eventually makes.